December is not even two weeks old and there's already been a 21% increase in Maitland's vandalism cases compared with the same time last year. Since the uh, 1st of November we've had approximately $23,000 worth of damage. Uh, I've estimated possibly around $16,000 $16, worth of that has been caused to motor vehicles in the area. Constable Etheridge says the police have a fair idea as to who and what's behind the spate of vandalism. Generally uh, we, we see that the juveniles, juveniles in the areas are actually committing the offences. They say that uh, they're bored in the area, nothing to do, so uh, they just go out and commit crime. Tony Penson's truck company was on the receiving end of young vandals, five vehicles damaged at a cost of thousands of dollars in very lean economic times. I was horrified by the ages uh, eight to ten year olds were the main culprits and I believe a 15 year old was involved but you know, that's, that's ridiculous. It really, really makes you wonder where is, is the parent, parental controls. Maitland City Council officers don't know how much vandalism costs the ratepayers each year but in the case of this Tanambit Park which has been repeatedly hit the council has decided the buck has to stop. It's going to cost over a thousand dollars to fix them and the council simply doesn't have that sort of money to keep spending uh, to replace things damaged by irresponsible people. Conditions were much more to the players' liking today, although it was still pretty damp underfoot. Queenslander Clark Joyce, two shots off the lead overnight, blew out a little today, his putter deserting him at crucial moments. And Joyce finished on 219 after three rounds, five off the pace. John Sendham was again a model of consistency, and his 73 leaves him in striking distance of the leaders on 216. Matthew King of Brisbane couldn't emulate yesterday's fine 68 and he finished today with a 74 but still is in with a big chance, one behind the leaders. And on top of the leaderboard, Brad Sullivan of New South Wales who shot a 70 today to go with his earlier rounds of 69 and 73. And joining Sullivan in the lead is Glenn Lilly who shot a sizzling 69 which included an outward 9 of 6 under par 30. A triple bogey on 17 ruined a sensational round but his form could see Lilly declared champion tomorrow. The leaders hit off at 11.15 in the morning for the final 18 holes. The young patients forgot about their aches and pains and celebrated the festive season with the NBN Choir. It's the choir's first visit to a hospital and it's certainly proved popular. But it wasn't just the children that were treated, grown-up patients were also given a healthy dose of Christmas cheer. One hundred and twenty competitors faced a four-foot offshore swell for the final day of competition and the amateurs as well as the pros turned on a sparkling display of radical manoeuvres. Michael Eppleston of Port Macquarie grabbed his second win on the pro tour, outpointing Adam Murray also of Port 4-1 in the final. In third place was Adrian Heibner of Mona Vale who couldn't match the brilliance of the Port Macquarie duo. Five divisions were fought for in the amateur section with honours divided between Newcastle and the Central Coast. There is a great temptation to buy now and pay later, but according to Lifeline, some shoppers who do this will suffer the consequences after Christmas.
Our financial counsellors here in Lifeline have a lot of people who come in, particularly towards the end of January, February, when the accounts then arrive and they just do not have the money for paying those accounts. Lifeline warns people to give presents they can afford and not to lose sight of the real meaning of Christmas. You know, you can still give a gift, but a $2 gift is just as acceptable as a $20 or $200 gift. It's not the price of the gift that counts. You know, it's the intention. So the message is, have a Merry Christmas, and with some careful financial planning now, a Happy New Year. Jane Anderson, NBN News. While most organisations are winding down for Christmas, Hunter Tafe is gearing up for a change of name and structure. Amid the removalist boxes, what is going to be the Hunter Institute of Technology from next year is taking shape. The Institute's new director, Dick Jordan, who's had three different titles in the past two years, believes this latest restructuring will bring more stability to the region's 16 Tafe colleges. Newcastle is effectively controlling its destiny with Tafe and the sorts of courses we run, the way we run them and where we run them will largely be an institute responsibility. Mr Jordan says the changes are not about saving money for the cash-strapped TAFE system. It's all about trying to provide better educational outlets. A recent financial projection for TAFE predicted 90,000 students throughout the state would miss out on a place next year and thousands of part-time teachers could be out of a job. But Mr Jordan says with the Hunter Institute now receiving federal funding, this region's TAFE student population of 40,000 and the range of courses will increase. We're now in a situation that we'll be able to provide the same range of programs, in fact something like a 10% increase in the number of places uh, at the beginning of 1992. Weighing in at 80 tonnes and stretching more than 90 metres, this massive steel structure has kept 15 workmen employed for the last six months. It's called an ash hopper, a giant tray that sits below coal-driven boilers in power stations. Ash fallout is caught in the tray, which settles through water onto a conveyor belt and is then transferred to a dump. Newcastle company Steel Coatings and Fabrication won the contract ahead of two Sydney firms. It's getting us out of a recession that everybody else seems to be, be struggling with. The hopper is the first of two for a new power station, Mount Piper, west of Lithgow. Mount Piper is about half the size of a Raring and is expected to be in operation by September next year. Of the retiring directors, John Duncan seems likely to be re-elected, as does Kevin Sharp. Michael Hill, in many people's eyes, the one to take up the reins of chairman, should have little difficulty in regaining his position on the board, but the man under siege is current chairman Max Fox. Fox was unceremoniously dumped by the NRL at their recent elections and is now fighting for a spot on the board from the floor. With a proxy vote issue a major player in Thursday's meeting, Fox has knocked on plenty of doors, even phoning other candidates canvassing their support, with very little success so it seems. New candidates are Ray Knight, Brian Jack, Brian McNeil, Mark Apthorpe, Graham Simpson and Phil Crockett. And for Crockett, the director's role is in the boardroom, not in public. I believe they've got to do their work and when they do their work, they leave. They're not uh, people to wear blazers or anything like that. They've got a job to do and... Uh, the footballers have got the main job to do, but the people that run the club and are just hidden faces to me. They're people that should be there in the background. Crockett runs a third generation commercial business that turns over between 12 and 14 million dollars a year and employs 120 people. The company director was on the Falcons board for seven years and has had a long relationship with rugby league. Crockett feels it's time business people should run the night in itself a million dollar outfit. 
a club's only as strong as its board. And you, you look at how well North Sydney's come on in the last couple of years under a strong board. And backing those sentiments is Graham Simpson, a foundation member of the Knights, a former Macquarie United president and late businessman. Days are gone of the, uh, the small money uh, raising. I think we've got to get on now, uh, look at further afield and get some big dollars in the club to keep competitive, not only in the football club, but uh, in the Winfield competition. It's very important. At the same time, Simpson, if elected, wants everyone to pull together. We've all got to get out there and do it, and uh, I, I believe that some very good fellows are uh, coming onto the board with some good expertise, and I feel that uh, I'd love to be a part of that, and I think uh, we could make a very, very good future for the coming of the Knights. Ninety-one people arrested during the weeks of protests at Look At Me Now Headland had to turn up at Coffs Harbour Court this morning. They faced charges of unlawful assembly and watch and beset, Crimes Act offences carrying penalties of up to $500 in fines or six months jail. Their bail was continued today with the hearing adjourned until the 13th of January. They say the court appearance involving local people from all walks of life should silence critics who've described the outfall protest as a rent-a-crowd operation. It's just a cross-section of the small community of Emerald Beach. It's nothing more, nothing less. Still more protesters are due in court here next Monday. By then more than 300 charges will have been heard over the outfall dispute. But it may not come to that. Their legal advisers are planning to make representations to the police department to have all the charges dropped. Ian Cameron, in Coffs Harbour, for NBN News. On Friday night, Mr Morris faxed a letter to Paul Keating that he admits amounts to political suicide. But the member for Newcastle says better that he kill his own career than stand by and watch the leadership debate tear out the ALP's heart. It's gone long past the stage of being worsened. It couldn't be any worse. In his letter, Mr Morris tells the former Treasurer that it is now amply demonstrated that your presence will be a continuing source of instability and divisiveness almost regardless of your actions. Mr Morris says Mr Keating's supporters are sabotaging the government and he should have disowned them and their comments. His failure to do so uh, means that he has to bear the responsibility for it. And he either, if, he, if he can't control his mates um, or influence them, then he becomes a victim of them. Mr Morris goes further than any of his caucus colleagues have done to date, openly calling for Mr Keating to resign from Parliament. It appears, he writes, that the only way you can prevent yourself being used in this way is to remove yourself from the Parliament. Mr Morris believes that even if Mr Keating does topple Bob Hawke, the same would soon happen to him. I have no doubt that within the caucus, uh, the majority of people don't believe Paul could win the election. And Mr Morris says even if the Keating challenge is successful, his reputation will be poisoned. And he'll be seen then as the person who destroyed the Labor government and the most successful Labor Prime Minister in history, the most successful Labor government in history.
Ian Moss is no stranger to huge outdoor shows and today he was at the foreshore imagining how this stretch of green will be transformed into a sea of party goers faces on New Year's Eve. It's great, lots of, lots of water, open air, it should be, uh, should be uh, outdoor gigs are the best if you've got, when you've got good weather so it should be great. Since his days with pub rock performers Cole Chisel, Moss has been a regular visitor to Newcastle although his planned New Year's Eve show at the Palais two years ago virtually crumbled into cancellation. Of course we're talking about the earthquake late 89. Um, we were due to do the, uh, the Palais on New Year's Eve that year, but uh, of course uh, it was uh, a little unsafe, probably particularly for a rock and roll gig. <laughs> the concert, which will also feature fireworks and jazz and classical groups, has been criticised for putting part of the foreshore off limits to non-paying revellers. But Moss says the $15 admission price is fair enough, considering the costs involved, while promoter Peter Anderson says party goers will still have access to the harbour side. The whole foreshore is not being closed. In fact, it's only uh, a small area from and including the brewery up to Watt Street, which leaves approximately 80% of the foreshore for people that would like to come down and, and uh, just do their own thing. Over the last two years, the Region Art Gallery has acquired over 100 new works of art, the most famous being Bird in Bush by Arthur Boyd, Clifton Pugh's Rites of Spring and two works by Rodin. But the gallery is also proud of this piece of work gained at a London auction. Painted in the early 1800s, the painting is of Newcastle from Fort Scratchley. Thanks to the support of Port Waratah Coal Services, admission to the gallery has remained free of charge and around $30,000 a year is spent on new pieces. This year, however, the gallery embarked on a mission to replace some of those works damaged or destroyed in the earthquake. They include work by Elaine Key, such as this monumental pot. The acquisition exhibition opens tonight. The accident happened at about 2.30 this afternoon at Marks Hill near Bellingen. The Mazda sedan failed to negotiate a curve and left the road, rolling over an embankment into trees. Both the male driver and female passenger were trapped inside the vehicle. Bellingen emergency squad volunteers were called in to free the couple, but the driver had already died. The woman was taken to hospital with minor injuries. Police are still investigating the accident and have released no further details. Another life was also lost on the state's roads today, this time near Wollongong. The Santa caps seen bobbing above the spinning machines were a sure sign that Christmas is coming. But for almost a third of Rockley's employees, the mood was anything but festive as they contemplated what Christmas would be like without a job. A very poor one. Because I'm not game enough to spend any money because I don't know when the next job will come, you know. There's nothing up here. It's a little bit depressing, but it's no good crying, is it? This mill has been operating for 40 years, but today the machines have been silenced and the jobs of 90 people have gone. The 90 finishing up today held a wake, the camera was rolling, there were tearful farewells and the toasts were shouted. Many of those laid off had worked at the Katara mill for decades and they held little hope of finding another job. Zero, just at present. A lot of them are going to be pretty hard off, I think. And, uh, as far as I'm concerned, I think it's the uh, wrong thing that uh, was done. Looking at a good Christmas, but if it's going to be a prosperous new year, it won't be put too prosperous on the dole. The Katara factory's other mill will continue operating until about April, filling existing orders. But after that, 
the remaining 200 employees will be retrenched, the factory shut and some of the machines will be moved to another plant in Victoria. Scott Bevan, NBN News. Police responded in strength to the armed hold-up report. Circulating patrol cars stopped a number of motorists who matched the wanted man's description, but on each occasion they came up empty-handed. The hold-up was reported at about 2.30 by staff at the Greater Newcastle Building Society on Brunker Road, Adamstown. They said a tall, thin man in his late 50s with receding grey hair and gold-rimmed glasses entered the branch carrying what they suspected was a weapon concealed in a brown paper wrapper. He demanded money, then ran from the building south along Brunker Road where he quickly merged with hundreds of Christmas shoppers. Police questioned another man wearing clothing similar to the description, but once again the hunt was resumed after brief questioning. Late this afternoon, police were still speaking to staff, gleaning more details of the robbery. Banks and building societies are on high alert at this time of year when the risk of armed hold-up traditionally increases. Tom Hilston, NBN News.